What's going on, everybody? Welcome in to Bischoff and Brown here on the Detroit Lions podcast. He's Scott Bischoff. I'm Russ Brown. We're back. 10 and 4. I've never been so stressed to be 10 and 4 in my entire life, but I've never been this. We've never been this good, so I don't know. But uh, Scott, my man, we win over the Broncos 42 17. How are you? I'm really good. It was, uh, that was a fun game to watch. Mm -hmm. It was, um, obviously, we had our little, our little bitch session last, (laughs) last week. It worked though. And, Sometimes, you know, uh, you got to, you got to sit, you know, you got to sit people on the bench and let them know how things are going. And, you know, uh, it was a fun game to watch, uh, really weird game too, how they looked in the first quarter and then how it all just seemed to come together. Um, defensively, they looked good. Uh, that was a fun game and, you know, We've talked for a while about them sort of slumping and and how that had the potential to be a bit of a a get right spot. And boy, you know that was a that was a fun game to watch. It really was. Yeah, it it really was. Um, you know to to have the defense play as well as they did to start the game is important. And I think that's something you know as I, I've really over the last several weeks of the show been venting about the defense and breaking it down and you've kind of taken the lead on the offense and the offense we're, we're going to talk about but defensively like you mentioned we, we had to bench some guys we had to put Jerry Jacobs uh, on the side there we had to put Tracy Walker on the bench and man oh man did they need it because Kendall Vildor even though I kind of dogged him last week because I'm unsure right I mean I, I didn't know what to expect from him he had a great cornerback blitz he did pretty well in coverage um, and at the end of the day the, the the one player that immediately stands out and maybe was outside of Sam Laporta, Jared Goff, and, and maybe Gibbs that really stood out was Ifita Melifonwu at, at safety. I mean, he just, he played with his hair on fire. He was in the box. He was a single eye safety. He, he had split safety responsibilities. He was everywhere. He had a big pass breakup on a lob pass from uh, Russell Wilson at, at some point in this game. And they just... Strip they look, it, yeah, strip sack. I mean that, which, which was key, which was so it big. Yeah, it, it just was like first drive. The Broncos' first play go forty yards off to you know Jerry Judy. Brian Branch bites on the on the play action and the slant patterns wide open for Jerry Judy because we're running cover one man and Melifon with a blitz. They got aggressive, and that's all we've been asking for: get aggressive, send pressure. And they did. They they brought speed. They didn't just send Derek Barnes or they didn't bring in, you know, just Jalen Reeves Maben all the time. They brought in Brian Branch, Melifonwu, Vildor. It was great to see defensively. So on that play, tell me if I'm wrong, because I've been paying attention to the three linebacker look, mm-hmm. but I don't think Barnes was on the field. No. Campbell was and Anzalone was, but I think Malafangu stepped down into the box and the tight end kind of chased Hutchinson down the line and just o- opened things up there. And Malafangu had nowhere to, like, he had nothing to do. I mean, he's got his gap and that kind of stuff, but it's just, we want them to attack. And they, yep. and they did. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it paid off, but it's, but it's interesting that they went to a two linebacker look and brought, and put some speed on the field and immediately, some success just with it with getting up the field and attacking a player like Russell Wilson. It was good. Right. Really good. And I know Russell Wilson is not as mobile as he once was. He's not as mobile as a Justin Fields, but like you got to bring that speed element there. Uh especially when your best pass rusher in Aiden Hutchinson is is getting double and triple teamed on every single play. There's always a check release in front of him. He's never going to get a free release upfield to get home and try to sack the quarterback. And if he does, it's a miscue on the offense. Like they key him to make sure he's slowed down. And that's why it's been so important with Bruce Irvin. Like he's played limited snaps through two or three games that he's been with the team. But when he's out there, he's like an energizer bunny. Like he is yeah. he's getting back there consistently and getting home. And it's it's awesome to see that this defense 
just through one week made the improvements and i noticed a lot of more you know a lot more communication in the in the secondary cam sutton was directing guys like looking back it just didn't look like this free-for-all like i mentioned last week in my rant it was like guys were talking communicating they were getting depth they were getting where they needed to be there were lapses at times that's going to happen but at the end of the day they gave up 17 points they limited russell wilson they limited Cortland sutton they limited the run game um and it was just a, a great overall performance from Aaron Glenn, his defense, and these players. And then just offensively, they got in a rhythm. And I kind of joked around with some friends. Like the first quarter kind of happened. I was coming off of being sick, and I, I was I had a beer, and I was like, I, I don't, I don't just these aren't really going down. But I was like, <laughs> I'm going to change up the luck. I'm going to crack a beer on this drive. Sure enough, we go down and score. And I did my part. I cracked five consecutive beers in a row and chugging beers, and we scored five consecutive touchdowns and just a dominating offensive performance. So moving to the offense, what did you see offensively, whether it was the healthy offensive line, the the different skill sets at wide receiver, the different... I mean, what what is Ben Johnson? Was he in his bag on this one? It, it, it kind of felt like uh, after the first quarter and maybe after the first Laporta touchdown which was a bit of a weird play. Um, maybe even after there was a Jamison Williams play before that. That I, um, The first quarter was weird. There were, there were uh, situations where Goff was doing where there's a, there's a throw he makes to Montgomery, and it's, I think it was on third down, where his, both of his toes are pointed towards the line of scrimmage, and, he's, and he makes a sidearm throw, and Montgomery's covered, and running... You know, uh, same thing we've talked about for weeks. Running laterally across the field, seven, eight yards in front of him is Amon Ra. And there are like, there are like eight guys on, let's say, the right half of the field. And Amon Ra is running to the left half of the field where there's really nobody there. And if he hits him, he's running for days. He's wide open, but he locks on Montgomery. And it's like, so I saw that in the first quarter. I was, there was a little bit of, here we go again. Some of this, you know, stuck one read. Um, and then that they put that drive together and they scored. And it just was like, it's almost like they took a shower and all yeah. the stink kind of washed off of them. And then everything they did after that, everything worked. So, um, and, and I don't, there's no rhyme or reason to it. So it's not like you could, it's not like, oh, well, they did this or that or whatever. I know Ragnar was back. So that was, I mean, obviously it was a huge deal for for them in pass pro and running the ball and all those things, but they struggled in the first quarter. And there's no, I just don't know what it was that that caused them to struggle in the, in the first quarter that then went away and made everything look so damn easy. And it did. I mean, it really did. Uh, Laporta is ridiculous. The running backs look great. Gibbs, I, you know, I don't think we can say enough good things about Gibbs at this point and just how uh, explosive he is and how that slashing kind of Jamal Charles yep. sort of style where, you know, hey, we're lining up in the, a deep eye formation and, and he's, you know, this quick, he's at the second level and make it and makes one cut and it's like, here comes the other 20-yard run. I think he leads the NFL in 20-yard carries. Yeah, um, he leads he leads in yards per carry at like five point eight or whatever five point yeah whatever I mean, he's having a great year splitting time with with uh, with Montgomery so Gibbs is Gibbs as dynamic as could be I like that I, they got I, JMO involved you know yeah I, well and we mentioned JMO but I think the big thing too is just like when this offensive line is healthy they are the the best offense in football yeah it just yeah. is what it is like sorry Miami I know you got Tyree Kill potentially the best receiver in the NFL I know two has had a great bounce back season. But when and Will Birchfield of uh, 97 won the ticket had a tweet sometime this week or on Sunday night or whatever it was. The game being on Saturday has my days all messed. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna, at some point I'm going to say Sunday, and I didn't mean to. Uh, but when the Lions have their starting offensive line of Decker, Jonah Jackson, Frank Ragnow, and in uh, Glasgow and Sewell, they are five and zero, and they average an, an NFL leading 38.4 points per game. 42.2 yards per game, 179.4 rushing yards per game, 
and 5.5 yards per carry. And Jared Goff has a passer rating of 121.7, which is just like mind blowing. And it's like they, they can run the football. They can throw it around. They can do so many different things with that healthy front. And it's like Ragnall playing off of a meniscus surgery just two weeks ago is wild. And I don't know what that means down the road here with three games left, but like that, I think that's what makes the difference is that that offensive line bullies guys. I mean, we were watching it before yeah. we got on here. Just some of the duo blocks we saw, the, the the wham blocks, like they get after it up front. They do. I would also urge people to recognize just how important it is for them to have that line healthy. And then going forward, understanding that that may be a priority for them. Yeah. Is to ensure that. Yeah. So, um, you know, the injuries, the, the, you know, for the last couple of seasons, the offensive line just doesn't seem to have played together a bunch. Yeah. But, you know, uh, going forward, it's very clear that the offensive line is sort of the key to this entire thing, Ragnow specifically. And, you know, um, like I said, I mean, it just it seemed like that it seemed like Goff just kind of shook off whatever funk there was, and they took off once once that that drive got put together. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I mean, everything they wanted to do on offense, they they were able to do. It was easy, made it look easy. It's fun. Yeah, well, it was. And and, and you mentioned JMO, uh, my buddy Ryan Comic. Shout out to Ryan. I meant to give him a shout out last week. Uh, I'll give him one now, and I'm sure he'll send me a text. But he. Um, he had mentioned Sunday morning to me, he sent me a text. He goes, they must have listened to the podcast because they got JMO involved and it made a difference. And dude, I know it sounds crazy, but it makes you wonder sometimes. I like, I'm like, they're making some of these adjustments that we talk about. And it's like, are they listening? You know, but uh, JMO had- It'd be awesome more. if they were. Um, I, you know, if you wanted to bring us both on board and, you know, not pay us very much money to be a part of it, I'm in. Yeah. I'll fetch Dan Campbell coffees. I don't care, dude. I just want to be, I want to be in the locker room for one, one pregame speech because I promise you I'm running through a wall. I'm <laughs> running through whatever wall because he fires me up on everything he does. But JMO had four catches for 47 yards. He had seven targets in this game. He had the scare. I thought he got hurt yes. at one. Yeah. Fortunately, he's good. Um, but Amon Ross St. Brown, seven for one, 112. He had nine targets and a score, no drops. Uh, big bounce back week for him. Laporta had three touchdowns off five receptions. Gibbs had 100 yards rushing. He averaged nine <laughs> yards a carry. Um, and David Montgomery had 17 carries for 85 yards. I mean, they just 185 yards on the ground. We talked about that last week. The key yeah. was running the football and sticking with it, and they did. And that's going to be the key against the Vikings. We're going to talk about the Vikings here in a minute, previewing that game. Uh, but it's just a great win. We're 10-4. and yeah. four. And we control our destiny. We, if we, I mean, we don't want to look ahead to the Cowboys or the last game against the Vikings. We'll, we'll again, we're talking about the Vikings here in a minute uh, this coming weekend. But like, it, it's a great feeling. It's just a different feeling. And I, I talked with a friend. I told you about this before the show. It going into these games, you never know what to expect. But I don't feel like I did twenty years ago, where it's like, man, I, we're going to watch the Lions lose. We're going to be four and twelve. Like those feelings are gone. Yeah. And it's just like every game, I don't know what to expect, but I feel like we're going to win. And it's just like, I feel good. And there's warning signs. Don't get me wrong. We get worried. We pull the you know fire alarm a little bit, but there's a lot of exciting stuff happening here. And we got to just keep enjoying the ride. It was a great win. Um, it's been awesome. The things to be hopeful, are, and then we'll move on to Minnesota, is like you're seeing Brian Bland, Branch play a huge role, right? You're seeing... Uh, Laporta B, I don't think there's enough good things you could say. Like, I want to say he is, he is a top five, a top three tight end in the NFL right now. Right. He's a rookie. It's insane to say that, but I'm going to say it. Mm -hmm. So you have that going on. You have Gibbs looking the way he looks. And I know that, you know, they got crushed for that pick, but I mean, like he is perfect for this offense and Campbell's going to Campbell's Jack Campbell's going to come. He's going to be a good player for them. He's played well three weeks in a row. He has. And it's like, you have these four guys, these rookies who are making this huge impact on this team, a team that was already ascending and kind of pushing themselves into, you know, 
the window should open up for them soon. Yeah, the window is now. The window. I think they understood during the draft that the window was was wide open. Yeah, and you know, and to me, it's super exciting to see how much they're getting from these younger players. Yeah. Um, it's just it's great stuff. Let's move on to Minnesota. So we're, so what are we thinking? Yeah, we're, we're going to move to Minnesota. Before we do, we got to talk about the play of the week, which is yeah. powered by our friends over at Restore Hyper Wellness. Uh, you guys already know. Uh, we talked about them last week. I got to tell you about them again. Maybe you're an athlete. Maybe you got kids like myself that, you know, they're athletes. And, and, and maybe you're just trying to get back in the gym and you're just not recovering like you used to. But you know what? It's fine. I got a solution for you. You got to go check out Restore Hyper Wellness uh, here in Michigan in Northville or Birmingham. Guys, like I said, my son, he he is a three-sport athlete. I'm getting back in the gym. I've been going for several months now, and we both go to Restore, and we love it. Um, we go you know, multiple times a week because this, th- this place has everything. They have everything that you need from compressions to cryotherapy, even specialty services such as IV drip therapy. Uh, it, after just one visit, I felt good. I felt better than I ever had. And I, I have been hooked ever since. So they've got a ton of special holiday offers right now. You need to go check them out. If you've got a family member, a friend, uh, a, a child, yourself, whatever, and you need, to, you, you need to restore your body, you need to go check them out. So tell them I sent you from the Detroit Lions podcast so they can get you taken care of so you can get back to doing more of what you love. Don't wait around. Go check out Restore Hyper Wellness right now. You can go to restore.com or again, you can just Google it. You'll find it. Uh, find them on Instagram, social media, all that good stuff. Check out Restore Hyper Wellness right now um, to, to kind of restore your body. So play of the week, we we did this last week. We're talking about our favorite player of the week this week. And um, I'm going to start second and 16 uh, from the Denver 26 second quarter. 923 was left in the game. Um, we're going to try to eventually show these plays at some point, but copyright stuff. But it was 7 nothing. W- lines were up. But again, we, we talked earlier offense was kind of slow to start in the first quarter. It was second and 16. And it was one of those where it was like, I don't know, they might have to settle for a field goal here. The Broncos come out in what we think looks like kind of like cover four. um, And the Lions come out in a two by two set. Laporto and JMO are on the top of the screen or to the left of the formation. Laporto runs a dig route and JMO runs the out route. And uh, the defensive backs, they play off because JMO is just so fast and they honor his speed. But the impressive thing was is just how quick JMO is along the sidelines. He made that corner look silly. He juked him, kind of walked the tightrope, and the very next play was the Laporta touchdown. So like it set up that, and it just it just goes to show like if you get the ball in JMO's hand, like we've been talking about, good things happen. And it just it was a great play. I, I thought it really stood out. I mean, there's a ton of great plays, and it's hard to pick one. But that was one that really in particular really stood out from an offensive standpoint because we've been talking about JMO and I want to see JMO really become that number two receiver. And I think we're starting to see that. And I think as as these closing weeks of the season happen, that's what's going to happen. So uh, what's your play of the week here powered by? So just on that one, um, I have no idea how Denver's corner doesn't touch him. I, I don't know how that's this thing. Like it feels like like, and he's got this superpower kind of thing where he's just, he's in a position where he does things you don't expect that he's going to do. Like, I, you know, I mean, the corner was right directly in front of him. Yeah. Trying to tackle him and didn't touch him. He must have been, he maybe is, was a foot and a half away from him. Like, he right. could have put his arm out and touched him, but he didn't touch him. And then he went for what, seven, maybe seven, eight more yards, got the first down. And yeah, it was ridiculous. But on that, I love the the design. I think Denver kind of messed that up because if it was cover four, the safety has to honor uh, Laporta running that dig mm-hmm. and kind of jump that, which means I think it's McMillian covering JMO has the entire width of the not the width of the field, but you know he's got to like he's got to cover he's got a two way go to beat him. Yeah, I think McMillian res- uh, respected the speed enough to turn his hips inside. Thinking that JMO was going to run one over the top, like yeah, like post drop kind of thing, yeah. And then as soon as the as he turns his hips, Jamison Williams snaps that route off and run and breaks to the sideline. It's like it's a really nice route, mm-hmm. and it's a really nice design. But you know the precision of the route, the footwork, the speed, all of it, and then the after the catch stuff is just silly. Yeah, so, absolutely, love absolutely, it. love it. It's great. Um, for me, 
uh, I think it's at the 838 mark of the third quarter. It's just a run. It's just a really simple run. Mm-hmm. It's the kind of run that uh, an offensive line coach or an offensive 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 minded people would would draw up and say, "Yeah, if we just block this, we have numbers, and we should it should just it's going to open up for us." But it never ever works that like you know the defense is trying to stop you, mm-hmm. but. This play is it's to Gibbs. They run it uh, between Ragnow and Glasgow, but it's it's pretty. It's the way they run like a. It's almost like a trap or a, a wham kind of a concept where they let the defensive end on let's say um, Taylor Decker's outside shoulder come free because he sort of he swims inside um, and Decker gets out to the will and kind of seals him from the play and they allow the defensive end who's number ninety two. I don't know who it is to come across the formation, but they bring Laporta that way too. And they allow Laporta just to kick him out yep. or to, to trap him, whatever it is. And then they run Gibbs right behind him. But um, in doing that, Jackson, Jackson and Ragnow are doubling, let's say the one technique uh, on the backside of the play and Jackson gets him reached and Ragnow climbs to the mic. And now the mic is sealed. So there's really no second level help there. Right. And you look and you see Glasgow uh kind of blocks his the tackle out and Sewell takes his end for a ride and there's a gap now for Gibbs to just run through. It's probably a 4 or 5 yard gap. Yeah. And he gets into the second level untouched. He makes a cut. I think it's a he might even have beat Sertan on this play where um he beats somebody maybe 10 yards downfield. Then he gets to the sideline and breaks a tackle. And then he now he's running towards the end zone. He breaks another tackle. He makes somebody else miss. He breaks another tackle. And then there's a big defensive tackle down there or, or an end. And he sort of he stops himself and he wants to kind of just pull himself backwards. Mm-hmm. And he's going to do this at some point. He's going to make all these guys miss and just kind of walk into the end zone. like It's, like, it's going to be like magic. Yeah, uh, but it was it was all you know the design of the play, the physicality of the play, the execution of the play, and then the speed and the agility and all that stuff, the elusiveness, and almost the impossible to tackle him is all on display in this play. It's it was awesome. It was yeah. super cool. That, that, it, you know, for me, that was the one that stood out. Is like wow, you know, like. Yeah, I know it's just it's just a run between the tackles, but it's Gibbs between the tackles, and he's really untouched for a while there. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's one of those like we mentioned. It's it's that offensive line setting the tone, um, bringing in the additional offensive linemen, doing all of those things make a difference. And it's getting a guy like Gibbs in the in the space like that. He's going five or six yards downfield without even getting touched, like before contact. And it's like. Yeah. He yeah. makes guys miss like that in space while getting through contact. And it's just, he's so impressive. That run was so- up a great point too, though, because it's something I missed on that. They, a skipper was in mm-hmm. as an extra, as almost like a tight end. And they ran away from him. And it was almost like they were kind of toying with Denver. Like, yeah, okay, we're going to bring in skipper. He's going to be our extra tight end. He's going to block Baron. I think it's Baron Browning. Yep. It's going to lock him out. And we're, we're just going to run away from it. Yeah. So you guys can slide your, you know, your defense away from where we're actually going to run to. It's going to make it easier for us to double and reach and climb. You know, it's it's cool. It's a and you know what? You know what's funny? It makes me think of last week when they were playing the Bears. They were doing tackle over stuff with Sewell going over to the left side, and then they would run away from it because the Bears would honor it because they saw yeah. Sewell move, and then they would run away from it. I guarantee you, the Broncos saw. Sewell over to the right side, Skipper now over to the left side, and they're like, okay, the tight end's over to the right, Sewell's over there, we're going to we're gonna slide, I think, away from it, because Skipper's over here, they're going to run this way, and then sure enough, yeah, there it goes Gibbs the other way. So Yeah, I think they definitely they definitely move their, um, their alignment to adjust for the extra gap there. Yeah. And the Lions just, uh, we'll run away from it, no big deal. It's yeah. easy. Yeah, okay. it's... It's awesome what they're doing. It truly is. You know, Ben Johnson was was really in his bag on 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 Saturday, and the, the way that they're able to run the football. If they can do that against Minnesota, if they can do that against Dallas, I mean, this team 
if they can run the football, establishing the run matters, folks. And get away from yeah. throwing it three or four times in a row, run the football, and trust that Gibbs and Montgomery can carry the load. And that'll open up things for Laporta and St. Brown and so on and so forth. So it, it's awesome. But that was Player of the Week, uh, powered by Restore. Again, check them out over at Restore.com, Restore Hyper Wellness here in Northville in Birmingham, Michigan. So guys, look, it's simple. It's the it's the conversation we've been waiting weeks for. It's the division is on the line. Lions versus Vikings in Minnesota. Christmas Eve. What better Christmas present than flying home with probably a count a, 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 an endless amount of beer in the plane <laughs> with a division with a division title? I mean, something we haven't talked about in this city since '93. I was. Does Dan Campbell me- seem like a guy to you who could put him away? Hundred percent. Yeah. Oh, uh, beer beers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Now I will say, when I was in Mobile at the Senior Bowl, I may have bought Hank Fraley a beer, and he may have bought me a beer, the offensive line coach. But I will say this: I did not see Dan Campbell out that night, so I don't know. Maybe he was off doing bigger and better things. But this this is a big game. And yeah. it's the biggest game I can remember in my lifetime. Uh, just, just is. I mean, it, I mean, I, 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 I want to win so bad. I want, I, I want a division title banner up. Um, I, I want to see them wear the hats. I want to buy the gear, and I just yeah. want to celebrate Christmas Eve with a Lions win over the Vikings. And to to do this against a divisional opponent, against a team that won the division last year in a lot of flaky ways that the Minnesota yeah. Vikings did. They and I know did. that you know, they've had a tough season with injuries, but you know what, damn it, so have we. We've had some injuries. We lost Gardner Johnson. We've lost McNeil. Um, we've lost some guys too along the way, and this team right. just keeps battling. I mean, we mentioned the offensive line. They've, they've only been healthy that starting five for five games this year, and they're still 10-4. and four. So I think in this one... Do exactly what you've been doing. You know, get pressure on Nick Mullins, get Brian Branch and Ifita Melifon involved near the box. And offensively, run the damn football. Just run it down their throats. I don't care if the opening drive is 15 plays, all run plays. I don't care. That whenever I think of that, I always go back to Mark D'Antonio, Michigan State Big Ten title against Iowa. They needed that drive. They had that nine minute drive that was like 18 plays for 70 yep. yards. I I remember that drive forever, and it's like I don't care if they have that drive, have it. That's what I want. There is nothing like being like like we're gonna run the ball. We don't care to throw the ball. You can't stop us. That, like we'll take the four yards of carry. It's good. All right, there's three minutes left in the first quarter, or whatever. Five minutes left in the first quarter, and we're up. And you guys have been sitting for a long time watching this. And it's Nick Mullins, you know, like he is going to, he's going to give you opportunities multiple times in this game to make plays because that's just who he is. He's also going to make plays too, but, and they have, I mean, they have, you know, they have good weapons. Justin Jefferson's, I I mean, I think he's the best receiver in football. Um, Addison's been a really good rookie for them. He has. Mm -hmm. Uh, Hawkinson's a really good, uh, uh, you know, pass catching tight end. I just think that, in totality, the Lions with with this offensive line right and healthy, uh, you know, going forward, and the ability to run the ball the way they do, um, takes Minnesota away from the things that they do really well on defense. Which, tell me if I'm wrong, I, th- I think they do a, lo- a lot of exotic things on defense, blitzing, um, you know, moving people around to confuse an offense or an offensive line or a quarterback kind of things, but. You can you can mitigate that by running the ball. Yeah, and I think that that's kind of the key. Is like if we're if you run if you run heavy, and you take away their ability to to hurt you, blitzing, and when you're trying to throw the ball, you mitigate all that stuff by being efficient running the ball. It's gonna be, it could be a long day for for Minnesota just in that regard. Doesn't mean that the Lions aren't going to throw the ball because they're going to, but it's yeah. just going to be play action driven. Uh, similar to what we saw, you know, la- la- last week on Saturday, I just think that 
that's it's more it's more important against Minnesota because they have been really good and exotic with what the things that they do with pressure. Um, so you know, I, is there fear about this matchup a little bit? I mean, it's you know they have good players. They're, it's a good team. You're on the road in your division with the division on the line, but it just feels like. Um, you know, it feels like for the longest, for the for maybe the last six weeks or so, the Lions have been in a bit of a lull. Yeah, and they came out of that, and we've seen them in the past when they get feeling good, it's good. Yeah, and last week was a really good get right situation. So you know, if they execute well on offense and, and do things um, where you know you can hurt Minnesota, I th- I think they'll be okay. It's a really interesting matchup. It just it it is. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, even though they've been down Kirk Cousins, the Vikings have played teams really tight. Um, Bengals, they lost by three. Uh, The Raiders, they won by three. Um, Lost to the Bears by two. And they lost to the Broncos by one. They beat the Saints. They beat the Falcons. They beat the Packers. I mean, they've got some wins in here. So it's, I mean, I don't think it's going to necessarily be a cakewalk by any means, but just some of the numbers as far as personnel-wise... Uh, they they run a lot of you know twenty one personnel and they run a lot of under center. I mean forty seven percent of their plays are under center, which is top in the NFL. Um, they run play action thirty percent of the time, third most in the NFL. So offensively, yeah. they're they're going to try to get you know Alexander Madison, Ty Chandler, those guys the football and establish that run, and they're going to play you know play action off of that with Addison and. And Jefferson on in breaking routes and out breaking routes like dig routes and and corner routes and those types of things. So I think the Lions have to be prepared for that. But really, the key is this: can they find ways offensively on the Lions' offense to I think get eleven personnel consisting of this: Sam Laporta at tight end, Jameer Gibbs at running back, and then the three receivers are Khalif Raymond, Jamo, and Saint Brown. Get your violent speedster receivers that have those vicious route running abilities and the speed to really open up some of the zone defense that you're going to see because they run more zone than anybody in the league 68 percent of the time so minnesota likes to run zone they rarely run man they run it 10 percent of the time they like to send six man pressures they're top in the league with that i mean it's brian flores so they're gonna blitz yeah. so yeah. our play action stuff might not always work this week. I mean, they're going to definitely try it. They're going to try to establish the run like you mentioned. Um, But I think the key is, is if you bring in those speedsters like that, they might be able to get into some of the soft zone openings um, with those zone beater routes. And it should work. Do you feel like like a 10 plus uh, catch guy this week? He he might have to be. I mean, him and Laporta might be just eating it up and and the hope is... Reynolds, you know, will have maybe a couple contested catches because it doesn't seem like he creates a lot of separation, but Raymond and, and JMO might. So yeah. I, I just, you know, defensively is what scares me because the Vikings have just done so well developing a lot of their defensive talent. They've got a veteran like Harrison Smith, but the Lions are three and a half point favorites on the road. The spread is big at, or the total is big at 47 total points. I mean, Vegas thinks it's going to be a high scoring game. I, yeah, see, the thing is, I think that the Lions can take away a little bit of the running game. And, you know, this is going to sound harsh because he's an NFL quarterback, but, like, if you take away their ability to run and you force Nick Mullins to beat you mm-hmm. under pressure, he's not going to. Yeah. So that's the key is can the Lions create pressure and get it um, and, and force him to feel uncomfortable and you know he's already he's already going to give you opportunities on defense anyway. So it's you know let's let's hope that the Lions can limit that what they want to do running the ball and and harass him a touch and just make it tough for him. Right. And I think that's the most we can hope for out of the defense. But if you get that and you play a, a good game on offense, you win. And yep. that's that's where it is. I mean, it feels <laughs> I feel dirty saying that, but that's where it is. No, you're right. And and I mean, I think defensively for Detroit, obviously getting pressure, but offensively, Jared Goff can't turn the football over. And I think if the Lions get one or two turnovers, they I mean, they should have this game. So I, I've talked about him for several weeks. Jack Campbell kind of been my guy. I got the jersey. 
I've been saying he's been close to getting in and around the football. Hawkinson, good player, very good player. Yeah. But as far as short area quickness, he's nowhere near Sam Laporta. And I think if there's going to be a player that's targeted a lot in the middle of the field, it's going to be TJ Hawkinson. Mullins, not a great quarterback by any means. Yeah. If he's going to target Hawkinson, I think Campbell's going to be kind of in and around that football. Maybe this is the time for the rookie to kind of have that big play as that first rounder, get that pick. Maybe it's a pick six. Maybe it's a forced fumble, uh, fumble recovery, whatever. It just kind of feels like maybe that spot for Jack Campbell in this game. And maybe I'm crazy. No, I'm not at all. I think it would be glorious for that to happen. For yeah. him to play for him to play that kind of a role in th- how important this game is. And, and you're right, this is a huge game, but it feels like a table setter kind of a game. Like this isn't this isn't the this is just like the next in line of the games that you should win to mm-hmm. get you where you want to go and where you can go. Um the Dallas game, obviously, in two weeks, is going to be super interesting, and the Lions do control their uh, their destiny as far as like what they end up as a seed goes. But you know, they played really well on Saturday, and if you if you carry some of that over, I think you're okay in this matchup. And and again, it, I don't feel super comfortable saying that, but you know, the Lions are a good football team, and there's and there's a lot of reasons that we should be uh, hopeful and optimistic about what they are doing, especially after the performance on Saturday against a team that came in playing pretty well. Yeah. That's an ass whooping. I mean, it's, it just was. Yeah. So, um, I can't think of a better way, uh, to win a division than to just, to go into Minnesota and just kind of, to, you know, kind of buzzsaw their way through that game. Be great. Yeah. No, I think I think it's huge. You knock you would essentially knock them out of the playoffs. I mean, at least as far as the playoff hunt goes, they would go to seven and eight. They'd go from the sixth seed to probably the eighth seed. Um, and that would take them out. Um, Thursday's a big game this week, uh, Rams and Saints, which is terrifying because if the Rams win, they're probably gonna if everything goes right, the Rams win and the Lions win on Sunday. The way it's sitting, the Lions would play the Rams if the playoffs started on like Monday. So yeah, well, and you know it's something that's really important. Sorry, I'm, I apologize. Oh, you're good. You're good. Um, it's really important for teams on their way ascending to eliminate teams from the playoffs as they're as they're as they're making their way. So, like, you know, um, some teams have to get over that hurdle, and they have a hard time like sticking the knife in and finishing somebody else's season. Right, going on the road and doing that to Minnesota in week. 16 is a big deal. Yeah. Hey, we ended your season. Ours is still going on, but we ended yours. Yeah. So you guys are going to be, you know, in two weeks, you guys are backing up and done. Uh, we're, we're moving on to bigger and better things. I think it's important for a team like the lions who have, who haven't, you know, been in the playoffs and, and won like huge games like that to be able to do that in the regular season to then say in week 18, we beat you two weeks ago. We're going to rest some guys because, you know, maybe, maybe there's a scenario where you don't have to play everybody in week 18, but a guy like Hendon Hooker might get some time. Uh, I know that's looking ahead, but that's kind of where I'm at with it. Like, it's just like, that's what, that's what I want to happen that. And this, the first step to making that happen is winning this weekend. So uh, super optimistic and hopeful that that happens, especially after the way they played Saturday. Absolutely. And we'll, I mean, maybe we'll get Ali McNeil back. Maybe we'll get Chauncey Gardner Johnson back. Uh, I mean, certainly for the playoffs, it feels like those guys will both James be back. Houston. Yeah, Houston. I mean, so some good things are coming defensively and offensively. I mean, as long as that front line stays healthy, we're clicking. So, yeah, tons of great yep. stuff. We're 10 and 4. We're, we're happy. We're feeling confident. We're feeling good. Uh, Vikings this weekend. Um, But you guys, of course, can always rate, review, and subscribe to the Detroit Lions podcast here on YouTube or Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all podcast platforms, wherever you get your stuff. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to our show. And then, of course, you can follow us on Twitter or X, whatever it's called, at Russ NFL Draft and at Bischoff underscore Scott. Scott, my man, you got anything else for us here? No, I'm looking forward to to reviewing this one uh, next week and looking forward to a huge game against Dallas. Absolutely. Well, we will definitely do that again next week. You guys have a great Christmas. Enjoy the holidays. Um, Go Lions. This is Bishop and Brown right here. 
on the Detroit Lions podcast.